Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, welcome to Club Cosmos! <laughs> Silver and I'm the editor of Cosmos, Australia's number one science magazine, and I'll be your host tonight for this intellectual jelly wrestle of science. Tackling a particular topic, tonight's topic is the planet's oceans and their contribution to life on Earth. How do they fit into biodiversity? And of course, our provocative question, do we really need the oceans? Um, we have to tackle this uh, somewhat... Uh, Fascinating topic. We have assembled a distinguished panel of, uh, panel of oceanic experts uh, who, thanks to the magic of a pub setting and the liberating effects of alcohol, will tell you not only all you need to know, but stuff you didn't even dream you needed to know, and stuff you probably didn't want to know. Let me introduce you our fabulous guests. Our fabulous guests. First, uh, to my extreme right, and I don't mean that in political terms, is Maria Byrne. She is Professor of Deve Developmental and Marine Biology at the University of Sydney and has a particular interest in marine invertebrates, including sea urchins and sea cucumbers. Uh, she's Director of the University of Sydney's uh, One Tree Island Research Station on the Great Barrier Reef, where current research into environmental toxicology, neurogenesis, and the origins of the central nervous system's... Hmm, system helps researchers monitor the health and conservation status of aquatic animals and ecosystems. Maria has worked on echi... <laughs> okay, echinoderm fishes. I don't know what that is, you're going to have to explain that to me. Echinoderm fishes, uh, fisheries and aquaculture in Ireland and has represented marine science as a member of the National Oceans Advisory Group of the Federation of Australasian Scientific and Technological Societies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maria Byrne! Now in the centre is Tracy Rogers, she's a research biologist and former director of the Australian Marine Mammal Research Centre at the Zoological Parks, Parks Board of New, of New South Wales. Uh, she's now based at the Evolution and Ecology Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. Uh, she's worked in the Antarctic since the early 1990s and has focused on the impacts of climate change on the Southern Ocean ecosystem. Uh, using the leopard seal, which is an apex predator, apparently, uh, as an indicator species. Her research straddles foraging patterns, reproductive behaviour and spatial movements of marine animals using everything from stable isotope analysis, which I know a lot of you have tried yourselves, uh, to satellite tele telemetry. So please welcome Tracy Rogers! <laughs> and last but not least, we have uh, to my uh, immediate right, Brad Warren who has, the, uh, has been the owner and operator of a number of Australian commercial fisheries and has written about marine conservation for more than 20 years, which is pretty amazing considering he's 25. He's, been, uh, ex he's executive chairman of uh, Ocean Watch Australia since 2003 and manager of the Productive Oceans Partnerships Program and has been working towards uh, the increase of sustainability in the Australian seafood industry by protecting and enhancing our marine habitats. Uh, he's founding director of the National Fisheries Conservation Centre and has served as a consultant to several organisations, uh, including the Marine Conservation Alliance and the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation, which is based in Rome. Did you get to travel there? No. Uh, please welcome <laughs> Brian Warren! <laughs> okay, now let's get into this. The oceans, okay? They're big. They cover three quarters of the planet. Do we need them? I mean, what, what have they ever done for us, the oceans? Who would like to take this first question? Well, I'll take that. The oceans have been our lungs. They've been sitting there absorbing all that CO2 that we've been pumping out. Almost all uh, the greenhouse gases that have been produced since the Industrial Revolution, CO2 has been absorbed by the ocean. If we didn't have the ocean, we'd be a hell of a lot hot, oh, excuse me, a lot hotter than we are now. You can say hell. Yes. It's official. Yes, I can. It's about right. This is like uh, cable TV, because it's internet broadcast, we can, yeah. we can say pretty well what, whatever the hell we like. Yes. <laughs> um, so, the, I thought the Amazon was the lungs of the, the planet, but actually the oceans. Well, the ocean absorbs, I mean, most, it could be planet as they say, planet ocean rather than planet Earth. Right, that's true. Most of the ocean is covered by sea, most of the Earth is covered by seawater, and that sea is absorbing 
all the most 90% of the CO2 that's being pumped out. The Amazon is producing the oxygen, but so is the ocean. Because the ocean has this thing called phytoplankton, little organisms, little plants, which photosynthesize, which produce a lot of O2. So phytoplankton are actually plants. Plants, of course, little single cell plants. So it's kind of like uh, an Amazon forest of the ocean, but they're kind of tiny. Yes. So if you took all the trees of the Amazon and chopped them up into little bits and had them photosized, and that's about right. The whole ocean. Wow. There you go. One something new here tonight. So, um, so they do more than feed us the oceans because you know the, most people think of if they think of the oceans, they kind of think you know going to the beach, um, fish, you know, fishing. Well, I think that um, the oceans are our food bowl as well as um, our playground. And in a way, um, I suppose the oceans do some conservation stuff for us as well. Um, I was um, doing a bit of research for tonight and uh, I um, come across some, um, some little videos on uh, YouTube uh, and Professor Ray Hilborn was talking about uh, fishing and, uh, and the impacts of fishing on the environment and he made a statement that if, uh, if we stopped all our fishing and had to replace the uh, protein we get from fish with um, grazing animals, we'd have to cut down the rest of the world's rainforest 22 times. So I wow. suppose that um, the oceans are saving our forests. Yeah. Wow, I had another. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. But you've been in fisheries for a long, long time. Um, you, you know, it's not like uh, we're ever going to run out of fish, are we? I mean, it's it's pretty big. It's three quarters of the Earth's surface. Well, we can run out of fish if we don't look after. Um, the, uh, the habitat and the water that um, produces the fish, and we can run out of fish if we if we harvest too many fish um, in the first place. So, um, like all avenues of human endeavour, we need to to manage what we do and do the right thing. I guess that's the that's the, the different thing about um, when we when we think of you know if you're if you're a, a meat eater, um, which effectively is what we're doing with fish by eating fish, um, with meat, if you're eating beef or if you're eating um, chicken, you're actually eating uh, an animal that is um, corralled and, and, and raised so that for particular, for consumption. That isn't the case with fish, it's actually wild hunting. It's hunting out in the wild, but in large, massive quantities, isn't it? Yes, it is. So I suppose, think of the animal ethics side of things. You know, you might have chicken tonight and the poor old chook, it's been bred from an egg and um, grown up full size and it's had its head chopped off in, at the age of six months or whatever and spent its whole life in a cage just for you to have your chicken meal. Whereas the fish, it gets to swim around and go abandoned and has a lovely life until one day gets scooped up in the net and um, it's all over for him too, but uh, at least he's had some sort of a life. You can tell he's selling the fish idea here, isn't it? But there's also, I mean, there's lots of other reasons to have fish. It's, it's very good for you and all that. But you're seriously saying that we're, we're getting to a point where uh, we might actually push the, the wild oceans from which we draw this fish. We might actually um, endanger that. Is that what you're saying, Brad? Um, here in Australia, we have a really good record of fisheries management. Um, so... Here in Australia, you should feel feel good about eating fish. Um, if you're living in Europe or maybe in some Southeast Asian countries that don't have the regulations that we have, um, maybe it's a different situation. But um, certainly here in Australia, our fisheries have been measured to be um, sustainable, and um, uh, there's a there's government regulations surrounding the harvesting of of all the seafood, and uh, um, the fisheries managers are doing a pretty good job from a from the rest of the world's perspective. Now, um, Tracy, I was going to ask you, before I ask you this next question, I just wanted to know about the One Tree Island Research Facility. Is there actually, is there actually one tree on One Tree Island? Well, when Duke saw it in 1798, there probably was. And it was probably just after a cyclone. I see. And probably so that's it. Because now it's covered in bushes and trees. Well, they're very low lying because one tree is just about at sea level. So we abandoned the cyclone Hamish because the storm surge would have gone over the island and we had to go. 
But uh, no, there's a more. We have a little island called Two Tree, which really does have two trees. Okay. But we have another one which is called One Tree, but it has lots of trees and lots of birds. It just gets confusing. Actually, my, my, my question is to Tracy. Tracy, um, we were talking about um, how sustainable fishing is can be done in Australia and, and largely is done. But isn't it true that um, the Southern Hemisphere has a lower productivity than the Northern Hemisphere? For some reason, we can't draw as many fish if we want to um, eat lots of fish. We can't draw as many fish. Is that right? We've got um, uh, quite poor um, poor oceans. We don't have a lot of um, nutrients in the ocean, particularly around the Antarctic and different areas of Western Australia and um, different different areas. So, um, not as much iron in the in the in the water. So, you think that's the reason for it? That basically there isn't enough runoff from yeah. continents because yeah, most of the continents right. are in the north. So it's like fertilizer in the in the in the water. But taking up the, the point about sort of sustainable fisheries and kind of working in the Antarctic, you get to work with lots of um, ice pilots from you know who who um, run the the ships for us. And often they're they're Russian or they've come from other places and they've been pirate fishermen at different stages. So you kind of you know you working with this guy who's this you know lovely bloke, great great ice pilot. And then you start to talk to him, and he was responsible for like the loss of the whole fishery 10, 15 years before to feed his family and you start to hear his story and you go god the world's a, a complex place um, and uh, so yeah we'd, we'd often be doing science and then um, then the ship would be chasing after sort of pirate fishermen as well down and you know trying to get the orange roughy or or different other sorts of um, harvests mm. this is a, this these are not sort of you know black eye patch peg leg type of pirates are they Lovely blokes, lovely blokes with families and, um, you know, in, in desperate circumstances you can't feed your family or you, you go really fish out a whole population. A lot of these, you know, the, the orange ruffy, these massive big fish, they're really, really old and they didn't really realise that until, um, you know, somewhere down the track the fishery started and, and understanding that the, the, the demographics of the, the population sort of came later and so these massive big old fish, which are taste great and I think we made fish and chips out of them um, are um, you know Actually, orange ruffy is a really good example, isn't it, of, um, yeah. of how we thought we understood the fish and then it turns out while we're hunting it um, that actually we didn't understand the fish. We thought it was, um, you know, 70 years old and actually it turns out to... Could you tell us a story about the orange ruffy? Because it's quite indicative of yeah. what happens with fisheries. Yeah, the, the, the fisheries started, they found this, because they live on these seamounts, these sort of big kind of like mountains under the ocean, and uh, that um, they found this, this fantastic... That's because the nutrients... Get thrown yeah, up well up, right. don't they? It's exactly. thrown up by the mountain. Mm -hmm. So it's like that fertilizer sort of system happening, so you get lots of nutrients happening. And uh, so they found them, they're great, they're delicious, and uh, they're big, uh, they're easy to catch at the time. And uh, and so as the as the time went on, then they started to, to look at the um, the actual life history of the fish, and they found that they, they're up to like some 175 years old. <laughs> yeah. And that they don't wow. become reproductively viable to about 40 or 50. Everything you don't want to fish if you're like a fisheries person. And, uh, at, Prior to knowing that sort of stuff, because uh, my background's in acoustics, and I'd sit in, in these meetings, these acoustics meetings with these, you know, friends who were like, they were looking at getting better systems of um, sonar systems of actually being able to find the orange ruffy, because the orange ruffy were actually evading the nets, and so they were going further and deeper, and, and they could see them on the um, on the, the sonar systems that they would evade the nets. So all this effort going into improving this system to catch these fantastic fish, and then suddenly everyone realised that they were like, you know, massively old, everything you shouldn't hunt. So everyone, like me, was sitting there going, like, God, I was sort of like a part of that in a room of, you know, everyone talking about how do we catch these fish. So what we were trying to do, really, was catch the last of this precious populations. Okay. So we're really lucky around Australia that we're, we're in a situation where there's a lot of science goes into it beforehand and it's not, not like that kind of a, a situation. Well, we're not in a situation like we had off um, Newfoundland of Canada, where they actually had, they used to have um, cod, Atlantic cod, so plentiful that in the 1700s when uh, um, Europeans were fishing there, they were saying that they would drop baskets over the edge and pull up the baskets full of fish. So that was extraordinary, some of the richest hunting grounds in the world for fish. And then um, that actually collapsed, didn't it, Brad? Yeah, but I think a lot of things have changed since the 1700s. I think you probably, uh, <laughs> if, you, if, if you happen to be on this spot in uh, the 1700s, you probably would have been able to knock a wallaby on the head, but uh, I need that. But, uh, 
So things do change. But I think Monash Rough is a, uh, a, a, probably a good example of, um, of what happens when, uh, when the stocks get overexploited and, um, and management decisions are taken that uh, impact on industry and um, it's tough for the fishermen that have invested uh, their own uh, capital into um, the infrastructure to, to uh, provide these fish for the community. Um, uh, so um, yeah, management has taken um, control of that situation and there's very strict quotas now, areas are closed to fishing and um, the orange ruffy, orange ruffy stock is recovering in Australia. Is there an understanding um, amongst fisheries that the only way to proceed is with science? Like, because otherwise you, if you hunt something to extinction, then what's well, basic extinction? I mean, the, the cod actually wasn't hunted to extinction in Canada, but it was hunted down to such a level that it, it's actually, it's been, it's been closed, fishery's been closed since 1992, and it still hasn't come back. So the, is there an understanding in the fisheries community that um, preservation is of certain areas to allow them to come back is is kind of the way forward. Or is I think um, sustainability is very much um, uh, important to industry as well as to um, to consumers and, uh, and general people out in the street. Um, industry certainly doesn't want to uh, uh, harvest today and not be able to harvest tomorrow because they've made an investment. That in often cases, it's a lifelong and a generational investment. Um, a lot of fishing families, um, you know, the third, fourth, fifth generation, um, they want to see a sustainable um, um, industry and they want to see their families being able to continue in that industry. But really, harvest, the harvest side is only one side of sustainability. The other side of sustainability is really the production side. And we've done a, a hell of a lot of damage um, on the east coast of Australia and in other areas as well um, to um, the habitat that um, provides the opportunities for juvenile fish to grow into large fish that can be harvested. You know, we've developed all our foreshores. Um, where I come from up in the Hunter, um, we've got the biggest coal export port in the world. All the foreshores have been developed, a big hole's been dug there to bring ships in. They want to put a dam at the other end of the, of the river to stop the fresh water coming down. Um, they've built flood mitigation systems there to um, stop people's feet getting wet, but um, um, you know that system's been built for a 100 year flood and the floodgates have been closed um, uh, since 1974, I think. Yeah. So the whole Hexham swamp's been drained. Um, we've had the um, uh, the, the whole floodplain's been drained for um, agriculture and dairy. Um, you know, there's many, many factors that are impacting on the sustainability of the fishing so industry. What people, are doing on land. Land. what people are doing on land has impact. Maria, you've been nodding vigorously. Yeah. Tell us what's that all about. No, that's absolutely correct because, I mean, the Hunter is actually probably one of the best examples in New South Wales when we're facing the Tilligra Dam. And the, the, there is a sustainability issue if you want to keep the Hunter River, which is a massive, massive river, a really important river, if we want to keep that s s um, healthy, then we don't want to put it down there. We don't want to build big holes, and as Barrett's saying, the, the, the whole salt wedge will change. But to come back to the whole sustainability issue, the one thing we're lucky in Australia, as Brett, you said that we would be hitting, our, hitting a wallaby over the head, but in Europe, I mean, the Romans have been there. They used to be lions gathered walking the hills around Italy and around Europe. So Europe is a cod case and has been a cod case for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands. Australia were a bit luckier. We were kind of, the continent was discovered a little bit later. So we have a chance to do something right with our fisheries. And we don't have the problem of the tragedy of the commons either. This is the trouble with the cod. If Spain wasn't going to fish it, well, Ireland would. And if Ireland wouldn't fish it, well, France would. Well, the Canadians are going to get it. Well, we may as well all fish it. Because if they're going to get it, we'll get it. And then no one will get it. So as a result, you had this free-for-all in the North Atlantic. And as a result, we see the cod in the state that it's in. And it's probably not going to recover. Australia has the biggest exclusive economic zone in the world. And we have a big responsibility to mine our ocean and fish it sustainably. And it's a possibility. We don't have to compete with the whole of Europe trying to fish our stock. If it can only get this, I would disagree. There's a couple of harvest fisheries that I would suggest are not so harvested sustainably, but a lot of the fin fish are in pretty good nick.
Interesting, you were saying that we don't have to worry about Europe, but as I understand it, a lot of the problems that we have, even within the Australian Economic Exclusion Zone, are uh, with fishermen from, um, I don't know, Spain and uh, Japan. Yeah, they're the ones that are fishing in the Southern Ocean for the toothfish and orange rugby. They're the pirates, you know, the peg, peg legs. No, what, what makes them a pirate? Because apparently it's not wearing, not peg legs and having patches. What actually makes them a pirate? Is it because they're <laughs> harvesting without authority? Yes, yes. They're, they're stealing fish. Stealing they're they're fish. stealing our resources. Yeah. Big call there. Well, no, the, the, the Southern Ocean is a big place and it's very hard. Um, if I drop a, um, a paper outside here, a policeman might come and tap me on the shoulder because there's a policeman every square mile in Sydney. There's um, not many policemen in the Southern Ocean to uh, police the compliance issues around um, accessing the resource. And human beings, um, we're here today sitting in this pub because we're the, we're the top... We are the, we're the top organism for harvesting resources on this planet. You know, we do it better than anybody else or any other species, and that's why we're, we're where we are today. So in reality, if, um, if there's a resource there um, and the resource um, really needs to be managed um, because it's going to get exploited by somebody at some stage, and uh, if there's a management regime around it, we well, need to have compliance as well because... Um, Unfortunately, um, while most people have a conscience, some people don't have the conscience or ethics. There you go, Earth. We're top predators, so back off. So look out, I might eat you for tea tonight. Um, well that, so the issue here is is um, the areas that are not under exclusive economic zones aren't actually patrolled or con controlled by countries. That's where the stuff happens. Is there any kind of treaty or anything that covers those those that aren't territorial waters? No, but what we're talking about is people that are uh, countries that are fishing under the flag of another nation in our waters. There's very little we can do about international waters. But uh, Australia has got all these great Southern Ocean, Heard Island, Macquarie Island, and each of those have a 200 mile plus now with the extension, the last extension that the UN gave us. So we've got this massive responsibility and a massive resource. Okay, but what happens in international waters? You're saying there's nothing no, that regulates it's lawless. Yeah. Right, really. Well, so when you say pirates, they're not actually pirates because they're not breaking the rules because they ain't no rules. No, it's a, rip, it's a wild rules. west. But the pirates, the ones that come to, you know, the Kirkland Plateau, around Heard Island, at, at McDonnell Island, uh, Heard Island, our, our actual um, economic... Well, that's, a, that's intriguing. Yes. Why would they need to do that if they've got... Because they're great areas. Ocean. That's why we've claimed Because they're great areas. Right? This is where of course, because you were saying the, all the nutrients come off the land. Yeah. So as you get close to land, all sea mounts... See, with nothing, 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 fantastic volcanic islands, fantastic volcanic islands, we'll have those and France will have the other half. And, um, and so that's where all the pirates go. And that's, you know, you see on telly the, the customs vessels and you know, Paul Murray Doyle is seeing that, the, you know, the captain going like, oh my God, am I going to be shot out again? It's all very exciting. Oh, it is. So it's like <laughs> totally pirate stuff on yeah, the wow, on the okay. And they chase and they, you know, the whole thing. And they are worth, that, that fish is worth a lot of money. Which fish? Uh, they, so the, so the, the, the toothfish. This is what we call the Patagonian toothfish. Yes, Which yeah. one of the problems we we have different terms for the same fish and people can't agree. No, they're different. Fi and um, some of the the fish that they're actually um, driven to commercial extinction because there was so much pirate fishery before we realised what was actually going on. And it was researchers being down around those areas saying, look, there's ships down here all the time because Heard Island, one of the islands that's in this Kerguelen Plateau, was one of the worst places on Earth. It's beautiful, but you have, basically you have to wear goggles all the time um, because you have these rocks hurling at you. It's so windy. And you look at sort of satellite imagery and you have these sort of swirls of 10 cyclones sitting on top wow. of it. It's, it's incredible. But, yeah, it has, it's, there's no, there's um, nothing there for very, very long periods of time. And then, as you were saying about the sort of massive upwellings, it's a massively productive area. So it's like a magnet to people to make lots and lots of money in very, very short periods of time. And, and along those lines, when being in Ireland, all the big factory ships, I mean, some of the Irish factory ships were the worst. 
Now, factory ship, what is that? They just go off and they harvest and harvest and harvest for weeks. They've These are very large ships. That, very large ships. That actually process fish they, on board. And they store them and they process them and they don't have to go back to port because they can store a lot of fuel. Do you get like chicken McNuggets or something? No, with um, fish fingers at the end of it? Is that how processed they are? Yeah, they're no. very, very processed. Yeah, they can sell it when they get to port. Yes. Oh. Yeah. But they're, and, and some of those ships were millions and millions of dollars to build. And the trouble is, these owners of these ships now have to pay the bill back that they paid to make the, the to build the ship. But they were actually subsidized in Europe for a while, They were, they? and now there's no fish for them to help pay the bills. All oh, right. Well, that's problematic. Yes. <laughs> well, is it? Here in Australia, I think we're probably um, lucky in a way that the majority of the fishing fleet's owned by individual um, small, yes. small family business type people, and um, um, the, the majority of the fishing fleet are uh, pretty much day trippers that uh, go out in the morning, come back with a fresh load of fish. So if you go down to the fish market down the road, here you'll see there's a few trawlers tied up there and uh, they work um, out in the South Fish Trawl. And um, they, they provide a lot of the fin fish that um, you have on your table. Those guys um, go to sea with a couple of deckhands, um, load up with ice in the morning, a bit of fuel off they go, have a couple of shots, catch some fish, come home, sit down and have tea with their with their family um, each night, just like uh, you and I do. So. so it's more a family business rather than a corporate uh, yeah, outfit. Right. So there's different economic um, imperatives involved in that. And, um, you know, it's, it's also, uh, I suppose, uh, the, the fishing fleet is spread out around Australia as well. So there's a lot of um, regional employment and... Um, other opportunities that come from fishing that are um, not necessarily characterised by the um, large factory ship that might uh, leave port and uh, be fishing for a, um, um, uh, a corporation um, in the Northern Hemisphere might leave port and um, the, the value of all the fish um, might go to the shareholders that um, <laughs> live in the city somewhere, whereas um, here in Australia our fishing industry is characterised by um, small vessels in small towns in the regions, and a lot of the money that's generated stays in those regions. But Maria, is one of the options then doing um, these kind of marine parks, where you say you don't take fish in those areas? Um, that would seem logical, but apparently the fish don't cooperate because they, they move around. Oh, fish move around, and this is why the, the, one of the most effective uh, educational tools with the rezoning of the Barrier Reef was what was called the Blue Highway. And this was the poster which showed the snapper going through its life cycle, starting in the mangroves as this tiny little larval fish. And I come back to Brad's point that we've got to keep places for baby fish to thrive. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the mid-shell freeze, and then they go to the off-shell freeze, and then they become a really big fish, and they're caught off in the blue waters off the Great Berry Reef, and everyone's happy to take the big fish home. And then they swim back into the estuary again. We've got to have a complete protection across the shelf. So marine parks are really important, but the protective areas have to be in the right place. There's no, as they say, there's no point protecting worthless sea. You've got to protect places that fish want to be and thrive so that there can be spillover effects of those. And despite the fact that some people say that that doesn't happen, but it's absolutely correct. In the very, very short time that the Barrier Reef has been rezoned, since 2004, we're actually seeing a massive change in the size and location of fishes in take and no take zones. And the most important reality check there's a couple of places on the Barrier Reef, probably 0.06% of the Barrier Reef, that is no entry zone, which acts as a quality check on no take zone. And guess what? The places where no one dares to go in because they'll be pinged, because in Queensland they have vehicle um, locators, the fish are very happy in no entry zones. Are we noticing... Uh the, some species coming back? Yes. As a result of this? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. And which one's the interesting one? 2004. Coral really? Trout. Big one. Coral trout. Actually, I've seen this across as, as you know, as a, a journalist doing science a lot. I, I see this that... Um, and sharks. 
I see this uh, in, in uh, wild areas. Once you get humans out of them, once they're not involved in an area, it springs back much faster than people expect. The most interesting example of that is Chernobyl, okay? Um, Chernobyl, yes, there was a nuclear accident there and uh, the area is more radioactive than you'd want. Um, but as a result, the place is full of wildlife. It's like a, a, a natural park. And that was, at Chernobyl was like 86. And yet the, the wildlife there is extraordinary now. It's like uh, the best thing that could have ever happened for Chernobyl was for humans to get the hell out. Well, the, the perfect example of that is places like Montreal Research um, uh, Station and the reef that it's right. It's an Which orange, has more trees than one, we now know. Yes. Yes. And it's an orange zone, and there are not many of them on the Barrier Reef, and it's been an orange zone. Which What's is an orange zone? A scientific research zone, which has no entry, for, um, for anyone can go there only with a permit, so 12 researchers a year, so very, very low human impact. Oh, and Gladstone, Queensland has the highest number of per capita boat ownership in, in Queensland. And guess what? They all fish, a lot of them fish up to the line between the open zone and the scientific zone. Because you know what they tell me? You've got the big coral trout there. We're just hoping they'll swim out of the orange zone and come into the other zone. And, it just, and they know that the big fish are there. Interesting. So Pink Floyd was right. Leave our kids alone. There you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little bit of a break, a 10 minute break. Uh, please order, um, if you wanted to order some food from downstairs, we've got time. Uh, there's also a trivia, you'll notice on your desks, on your tables, uh, there's trivia questions for which uh, we'll be drawing uh, prizes tonight. There are three, three trivia questions. Um, so I'm getting a bit of feedback there. I'll hold it this way. Am I, am I holding it too close, am I? I'm just loving this mic too much. Uh, the first question is, which of the following species has the highest total biomass? That is, if you put them all together, which species would weigh more? Well, A, sardines, B, humpback whales, C, Antarctic krill, D, common jellyfish. There's something for you to think about. So we're taking a break. We're back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.